All right. Thanks so, a lot for doing this, man. Yeah, no problem. I'm uh, yeah. happy to do it. I'm pretty interested in what you guys are doing with the uh, master class. We're seeing a lot more of those these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you want to get started, or you just want to just shoot the shit right now? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's kind of the the same thing. We do less of like a straightforward interview and more like a oh. talk podcast. So we could start whenever you guys are set. Well, dude, yeah, sure. Uh, whatever, whatever works for you, man. Just let me know. Yeah, this is cool. All right. Uh, cool. So yeah, we could we could start off here. Masterclass. Yeah. Um. Okay. Well, so Neil and I were talking about this. Um, we, we talked about it a few months ago, or maybe even like a year ago or something. But we kind of put it to the side, and then one of our friends actually brought it back up to us. Um. I guess about two months ago or something. And uh, he kind of just said like, hey, I mean, he was a student in the Jason Ross master class and he knew a lot of other students um, from that class. And, and, you know, he's like, well, he's a producer now. He's been getting some decent radio play and stuff, but he just knows a lot of guys who are interested in learning more and and kind of developing their sound and their skill set. And he basically just said, look, like, whenever we go to his house, like we always talk about his music and he shows us stuff and we give him feedback and everything. And he kind of just said, well, why don't you, kind of take what you're doing here and like actually put this into a course for other people because you know he from his perspective he was getting a lot of value out of it he was like this is really you know really useful for me as a producer so i'm sure it'd be really useful for other people out there too and um and hopefully we have a little bit of credibility to our names now with some of the places that we've been releasing on and so yeah um we just we just think that we have a lot of cool stuff to share you know like we've been producing between us for a very very long time now uh, combined and uh you know we have some cool projects we can show people and techniques and everything and shortcuts and um, I think we're just at a point now where we kind of want to share that stuff back out so that's kind of how it came about and then Neil put some of his web design skills to use and made a website and, and that's where we're at now so yeah it, it actually kind of came together fairly quickly it, like a shaking said it was something that we had both wanted to do for a really long time um, but it was not until our friend had really put the idea in our head uh, that we kind of just we put the whole thing together really, um, at least as far as the front end is concerned, uh, in a matter of a day or two. Um, we're still working on the course materials and stuff for the classes itself, but we have a pretty good idea of what we're going to do. So uh, I'm really glad we decided to do it. Yeah. Uh, you were saying combined you guys have like a couple of years. How long have each of you guys been producing? Oh, man. Um, so I have my master's in music. So, I mean... We're talking electronic music, it's a little bit shorter, but, you know, I grew up playing a lot of instruments and stuff, and then I actually went into a master's in film scoring, so I did a lot of, like, you know, writing for orchestral music and, and all that stuff, but then I really started producing electronic music probably around eight years ago, seven years ago, that's when I started doing electronic stuff solely, but before that I was still writing a lot of other different kinds of stuff. And yeah, that's still a yeah. long time. Yeah, the funny thing is, I think Shaheen has been... Um, involved in music uh, a bit longer than me, um, so I, I only uh, got involved in it in about about ten years ago. Seriously, started taking it seriously in about like maybe six seven years ago. Um, but I have a bit more uh, releases under my belt than Shaheen. Okay, cool. So you guys have yeah. a good balance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's cool. Um, and when we produce. Uh, you know, we have very different styles. Like, if you listen to our individual stuff, it's pretty different, actually. Um, my stuff tends to be, like, more melodic, and his stuff tends to be more, like, sound designy and bassy and whatever. And so that kind of com- comes out a lot when we start doing stuff together. And um, that's really good because it means that we can tackle a project, like, in two different parts, kind of, like, at the same time. You know, I can work on the melodic stuff, and he works on, like, the bass and the groove and drums sometimes. Definitely. Yeah, when, we, when we initially started working together, we were worried about our stuff sounding our collabs at least sounding like uh, two different tracks in one, but as we kept working together, we kind of found a way to get both of our sounds melded together properly. And like you said, um, I bring kind of more of the sound design to the table. He's more musicality guy. And I think just covering those two bases um, gives us a pretty, pretty unique sound. Cool, cool. Um, so are you responsible for that like future bass kind of pluck and swipe then? It's on me, yeah. <laughs> well, the bass, the bass stuff is him, yeah. Um, if you're talking about like the intro bass part, right? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That struck me as like a 
a very different thing. Uh, I mean, it happens pretty often with the Armada Trance that people pull from like other styles like that and create something new. Um, but I was curious how you guys um, decided to implement that, or was that intentional? Well, first of all, I was really happy and surprised that Harmon is opening up to um, kind of genre-bending stuff like this, which is good, because at, if we're taking Swipe, for example, at the core is a trance song, but we've kind of changed it up a bit, obviously, with the sound design. Um, so, sorry, what was the, what were you initially asking? <laughs> um, if there was, like, a intention behind that, um, why did you pick that element? Um, that was just... Uh, I think it was about a maybe about a year or two ago. I was like, I really, really need to um, do something that look, makes me stand out. And so I started to really master one or two synths. And the one of the synths that I really wanted to master was Serum. So I spent a lot of time just wrapping my whole head around it. And I was like, how can I use this thing? Like, actually use it, not just use it for to sound like instruments, but actually make it just sound like a synthesizer, make unique sounds that make people go, like, I've never heard that before. So that was the whole intention behind that and all of our kind of feature tracks now, is cool. all these yeah. sounds. The funny thing is, like, you hear the next couple things we've, we've already released, or we signed with Armada, they're not released yet, but the bass stuff is even more sound designing. <laughs> that was actually, so... It's getting crazier, it's getting crazier. That was just kind of like the, the tip of the iceberg for me, I think, when my skills just started to go in over 9,000, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the next couple, you'll see. We did a remix, and, and I mean, if you listen to any of Ruben's live sets um, over the last like festivals he's been playing, yeah, uh, Ruben Durand. Like, if you listen to those, we did a remix for him, uh, and uh, there's like this whole intro and outro bass section, which is just insanely dirty. It doesn't sound. I mean, I don't know if I'd call it trance, but it's just yeah, it's 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 even more brutal than <laughs> swipe. So uh, we've been there um, at at least two or three live shows where he's dropped it. I think two of them were Dream State shows and Dream State uh, and EDC, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, and uh, it's it always works really well. So that's a good sign. Yeah, the crowd. I mean, I remember the Dream State when we that was uh first time we played it was at Dream State, I think. And uh, he was opening that set, but like you know, Dream State's like a super trancey festival, so everyone goes really hard. So he kind of ramped up his set really fast, and uh, that was like the track, the first track that I just saw everyone kind of lose their shit to. It was really, really cool. Actually, we were in the audience for it. It was actually I Facetimed, I Facetimed yeah. him because he was at home. Shaheen <laughs> Facetimed me. It was so funny, and I took a bunch of screenshots of his face going crazy, and I posted it on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, it was cool, man. It was it was really really cool. So, so that's the first. Uh, that's that was the first of many, I think, with Swipe. Um, yeah. We're, we're trying to. I don't know. It's kind of weird. We're trying to explore like marrying our two different sounds, and it's really weird because if you listen to like a lot of the remixes I've done recently, they've been really really chill. <laughs> so, um, I, I just try to stick to the melodic stuff, I guess, and like the chord progressions and melodies and whatnot. Yeah. We're so I think we're on our way to building our own little niche. I think so. We just have to keep banging out. Unique tracks like that. Yeah, we're seeing that more and more now. I'm I'm kind of bored of artists who make like ten songs that sound the same. To be totally honest, <laughs> <laughs> I know that's like what everyone wants from like a lot of these uh, more like uplifting underground trance guys. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really interested in the change of the sound design. So I appreciate. I think, what you I think guys one of the reasons, that. if I try to quantify what you just said, is uh, that a lot of artists. I mean, to get that sound, they have like one sound or one preset, you know, one synth they use, and it just becomes a thing. The technique that I use when I design some of the sounds is kind of more of a complex stroke approach that you might hear in, in you know, electro songs that have those kind of ADD bass lines. Yeah. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll usually my bass stem will usually be composed of. 15 to 30 different sounds with one main sound, but supplemented by many different sounds. So that's yeah. why it's always going to be different. It's not going to be the same sound. Yeah. It's funny. If, if you look at any one of our projects now, like there's literally probably three different projects that go into it. Like we have a whole project just for the vocals, probably, where we're just doing all that stuff. Then we have a whole project just for like the bass sound design stuff because there's so many layers involved. Like, it's crazy, and then and then we have like one other project, which is like for just the main arrangement, right? Where we like we bounce out all the stuff from the vocal project and the bass project, and then we re-import them into the main arrangement. Yeah, it's so, so like easy. if you look at Swipe, like, like it's kind of funny. You look at the, the chain; it's like 
or is it the arrangement? There's like one track that just says bass, but you know, the the actual track that went to making that is probably like twenty or thirty, you know, yeah, uh, players. So, right, yeah, it's it's so easy to get projects really messy and then never want to touch them again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, and then and then they just end up in your project graveyard, which I have too many. Every producer has a project graveyard of just stuff that they've never released yeah. or always say they'll come back to, but never will. <laughs> it's yeah. funny, like, I don't know, as time goes on, I feel like we're getting more focused with what we want to do, too. Like, every track kind of almost serves a purpose, you know? We're not just, like, releasing something for the sake of it. We're like, okay, we want to do an instrumental track because we have this goal in mind or whatever. And, uh, you know, we've done a, we've got a vocal track coming out, too, which was... Uh, which is, you know, written for a very specific reason. And, you know, we remix Ruben because he's our homie. But, like, we don't just kind of just do off-the-cuff tracks anymore. So I find, like, I'm getting better at completing stuff, basically. I'm also taking on less projects because otherwise I just have this insane backlog that will never get completed. So Yeah, so you find knowing where you're trying to go is a little bit more important than the output? Uh, I would say yes, but then I, I'm going to contradict myself. Because, like, the, the funny thing with, like, Swipe as an example was oh, yeah. like we literally started off with that track like we we're just like okay well we had just written a track called find yourself i don't know if you've heard that one but that was like our first track together mm-hmm. um and that was on ride and it was with our friend uh max who's singing and we were while we were working on that we were like getting really bored of working on it you know one day and we we're just like well why don't we you know just fire up some new idea for like this semi like throwaway track we're like whatever let's just work on another song and it'll just be whatever and we'll just send it wherever, and it doesn't really matter. And then that song kind of like just sat there for a year or two. But the chord progression was really nice. I remember that we had written, and then uh, that track eventually became Swipe. And then we, you know, Ruben's been our friend. We, we've like we've been hanging out with him a lot over the last you know year or so. And so when it came to signing it somewhere, I was just like, well, we'll send it to Ruben. You know, he's been a good friend to us. And and then you know I sent it to him, and it, like I said, in our minds it was almost like this throwaway thing. We were like, oh yeah, we started this, and it's not really a big deal. We'll just you know send it off. And then I just remember one day, like, Ruben messaged me, and he was like, yeah, man, it's it's going to be on State of Trans 2017. And, like, my mind was blown, you know? I was like, what the hell? Like, I was like, you know, I grew up listening to those compilations, you know? And, yeah, um, yeah. And so it was, like, a really amazing moment for me, I guess. Um, and then I remember Neil was asleep, so he didn't wake up for a few hours to see the news. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, but we were just super amped. But it wasn't like, you know, we didn't. For that track, we didn't actually submit it for the compilation. It just kind of somehow fortuitously ended up on there. No? Yeah. I think um, what you were saying about um, is it important for everybody to be picky? I think it depends like where you are kind of in your journey as a producer. Um, in the beginning, I think it's really important to just put a lot of stuff out there because nobody knows who you are, first of all. And like you have to just put stuff out there and see what sticks. And um, people don't realize that you have to do that for a long time, many, many years. And then once you've kind of um, tested the waters, then you can kind of pull back a bit and be a bit more picky and kind of uh, make smarter decisions. Yeah, The other thing to that, too, is like it's not even just about people's, but it's also about yourself. Like, you know, both of us have written a lot of tracks. I used to have a different alias. And it, a lot of it's just experimentation for yourself and finding out like what you want to do and what you're good at and what you enjoy writing music, you know? That stuff's like even more important, I think, than people like and what their impression of your music is. Because it's taken a very long time for me to get to the point where I feel comfortable with the music I write. You know, a lot of the music I put out, even to this day, I'm still like, oh, it's not as good as it could be. But I feel better and better with every release, at least. <laughs> like this is getting closer to as good as I think I can make something. Definitely. And really, for yeah. both of us, for both of us, we have. Uh, I think we're both at the point where we have people where we go to for feedback, but. It, like we're confident enough in our own skills that we know if we write a good track, we know it's good. We're just kind of like sending it to people less for validation, more just to to make sure it excites something in them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I it's think that initial like, show back. That's one of the really like, important things, that feedback, I think, you know, picking a right group of people around you who um, can give you feedback relative to where you're at in your career, you know, finding the right people to help kind of give you objective feedback. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That that first backlog, like the first body of work, just track after track, I think is really important for people to get started on, um, because if they they kind of try to begin, uh, like you were saying, Neil, 
from like the current vantage point you're at where you want the objective and you want to wait until you're pretty happy with it um they tend to never get anything done so yeah it, it is kind of relative depending on i guess like the amount of work that you've put in and uh where you're at as an artist i mean and if you're really trying to be serious about it be professional about it, it if you have the right connections from the get-go, then there's no reason you can't be super picky. And there's people who just, like, I mean, maybe from the outside, it seems like they just came out of nowhere. But, like, there's a lot of people who, like, Shaheen and I, we kind of started with zero connections in the industry. And so that's how most people start. Um, but there are people who have had very little roadblocks in their, in their musical career. And so it's easy for them to make smarter decisions from the get-go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of people don't, seem to notice that like if they they come out of nowhere and their first release is on like an amazing label uh mm. yeah they they could have just you know decided to wake up and send it to armin one day or to ultra one day or whatever uh but more often than not they've been around those people for a couple years and they're kind of being like uh whether they made those connections or their manager or whatever they're kind of like hand delivered to that label when they're ready mm-hmm and, uh, There's also like that, for whatever the saying, which is like every overnight success is like, I don't know, a lifetime in the making or whatever they say, you know? Yeah, yeah. Ten, year, ten years. Ten yeah. years. Ten years in the making. Yeah, it's like, yeah, whatever the phrase is. It, I think that rings true too, though. Like, people kind of blow up out of nowhere and you're like, who's this guy? But in reality, he's been working his ass off probably for a long, long time to get to where he is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it's kind of a weird juxtaposition uh, with trance because it has that that very like glossy kind of commercialized image. So a lot of people kind of want to come out of the gate perfect, like just as perfect as people who have been working on that for 20 years. And it's like, well, unless that guy's helping you, you're probably, you're going to fuck up a little bit. <laughs> you just are. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's very much like, um, I mean, it's a, it's in any industry, really. You're su you're supposed to do collabs. You're supposed to ride the coattails of people who are big and use them to gain traction. And that's really the most proven method to success. Uh, like for example, if you're a if you're a YouTuber, the most proven method is to collab with big YouTube channels and get them to get you more subscribers, right? So much similarly, in music, you're supposed to get signed to big labels or collab with big artists and ride their coattails to make yourself even bigger. So that's the common path, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I think there's two or three elements to that, too. One is, like, you know, your big labels, like your Angina Beats or your Armadas or whatever, I mean, they generally have a pretty solid quality control barrier, right? And that's one of the things that makes those labels so prestigious. But they're also in a privileged position where they can do that, you know, because they know that they have the largest reach with their music, and so they're going to get the better material, and they can turn down stuff that isn't as... So it's clean, but that doesn't mean that you know you should feel bad about releasing on smaller labels too. I mean, I've released on Silk Music for a very long time, and they're like a happily independent label, and they're amazing. Like some of the stuff they come out with is really, really great. So you know, some of the small labels release amazing music too, and sometimes it's just a matter of the right song with the right connection, putting your music in front of the right person at that right time. Like it's really just that, you know. Um, in our case, yeah. for ASAW 2017, that's kind of how it panned out. Like, like I said, we didn't have any. Like, you know, we didn't even know that a compilation was being mixed up. Right, time. right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it just kind of happened. Um, but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people, you know, like your Super 8 and Tabs and whatnot. You know, Armin probably messaged them like, hey, putting together a new compilation. We'd love to have you guys on it, you know? So it's kind of different for everybody. But for most, it's like it's a good way uh, in the door, too, you know, for future stuff like that. Yeah, and it's great to, if you get that kind of deal you know your music is at a certain level, too. Like, it's less important to get the validation, but if you're working on this and you're new, it really helps to have that reinforced and kind of know uh, where you stand within, like, the production quality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, even for Shaheen and me, like, we've been doing it for a while, this was the first time where we had really kind of hit the top tier of uh, of the trance industry, one of my one of our friends pointed it out, and he was like, "This is literally the top." And so, it's it is it's validation, and it's good to know, you know. 
Yeah. It feels good for sure. Like it's one of those weird things where, like I said, I was looking at the track list and I was like, damn, like some of these guys are people I used to like idolize, you know? And it's, it's a really cool feeling to be on those compilations. Like I grew up listening to those compilations, the old Tiesto, the Search of Sunrise compilations, and like the Anjuna Beats compilations, you know? And um, yeah, it's how I it found was, like, out a lot. to be on those. <laughs> Yeah, it's how I found out about a lot of guys, like um, Tidy, uh, Sean Titus. A lot of them were re- repeat occurrences on those compilations. And that's yeah. how I sort of found yeah. them. And, uh, yeah. So I take it you guys are not pure trance guys. Pure trance uh, in the sense of like Solar Stone pure trance or just like pure trances in the genre? Like the the notion, yeah, not the label specifically. Oh, uh, well, I mean, given Neil's crazy sound design, bassy stuff, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I'm I'm actually a huge bass head. Uh, I'm I love uh, trap. I love bass house. Um, all those genres. I like um, Shaheen likes um, really drum and bass, right? Yeah, I'm more into like the very kind of melodic, chill, like liquid drum and bass stuff. Oh, cool, cool. Um, yeah. I don't know as much about it as I probably should. Uh, I listen to a lot of, like, Spotify playlists and stuff, and I have a bunch of artists I like. But it's funny because it kind of comes out in, like, the music we produce. Like, he does the more crazy sound design, bassy stuff, and I do the more sort of, like, melodic and, like, you know, I don't know pretty melodies and vibes and stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. It's good, though. So, Pulling from yeah. other places tends to be where a lot of interesting uh, things come from. And I don't know about you guys, but there was like this whole cycle quote about uh, Dream State and classic sets in like the past week that got a lot of traction. And I'm kind of like, did people forget that trance was initially like exactly that? Like someone took techno drums and like ambient pads and made trance? Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, <laughs> when I first got into electronic music uh, was actually through the more, you know, what people consider pure trance nowadays, like the uplifting side. Um, and that's why I still have mad respect for it, even though I don't really particularly listen to that side of the industry anymore. So, but I see what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Everything kind of comes full circle. Um, I don't know what year was like the first year you were checking out trance compilations. Me? Um, I was a fairly late bloomer, around 2008. Okay. So, probably, like, last Tiesto compilation? I think he was pivoting to more, like, general dance at that point, right? You mean, like, Insert Sunrise, what, like, 9 or something? Yeah. You're probably getting, like, the last of Tiesto and, like, Universal Religion 2, 3? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right around there. I was actually on Insert Sunrise 13. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That was uh, kind of like the first big compilation I was ever on. That was right when I first started producing music, so it kind of blew my mind. <laughs> cool. Was that a Richard Duran one or Tiesto one? It was Richard Duran, yeah. Yeah. He's got a whole interesting thing going right now, too. Yeah. I haven't even been following the compilations. Are they still doing those? The Insurgent Sunrise? Um, I think they are. They did one... Uh, the last one I checked out was disc one was Richard Durand and disc two was BT, and that was kind of interesting. Yeah, so, so he always having... had like a guest as a second disc, right? Yeah, that's like a yeah. new thing they're doing with that. Um, but we're seeing less of it now because I think the the music is more uh, song centered, and it used to be more about like the overall build, mm-hmm. you know, stringing together like that uh, two to six hour sequence of tracks that kind of like. Um, progress and build, and now uh, you kind of you want to go find the source of the music. You want to find the guy who made your favorite part of that sequence. And we're seeing more like um, singles and EPs than albums, so it kind of makes sense. The compilations are less around. It's it's more about the parts, less about the whole. Yeah, yeah. It's super weird, isn't it? Actually, like I mean. I still think there's something to be said for like, you know, the sets that take you on like a journey and stuff, you know, and I feel like a lot of those old albums definitely did that. But you're right. I think a lot of the newer stuff, it's a collection of songs more than it is kind of like a journey that a mix takes you on. And like, you kind of want to hear 
like you know what that specific song is and you want to find who that artist is you know and that's it's actually been a kind of weird shift i think that some of the other stuff still exists it's just it's not as pronounced as it once was like right yeah i think like for example the new engine beats worldwide compilation the grum one that's kind of more like a progressive sort of journey much lower bpm right but it's kind of like that than it is than like a track filled record, yeah but they've done a really good um, job of kind of securing and anchoring that one sound and people who like one Anjuna artist tend to like like ten. <laughs> you know, like they're immediately like, Yeah, I'm I'm down with all of this. I want an hour of all of that. I'm good. They're immediately hashtag Anjuna fam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys have any uh, opinions on social media? On social media? Yeah, like okay. for the artist Just... side. Um I think uh it's a dangerous place, you know, um, too, because I think it's something that everyone has to do nowadays. Like, it's kind of sad in some ways, too, right, that, like, there's more emphasis on, like, how many Instagram followers you have than the music you create, you know? Um, I think that's really sad. I think it's also dangerous because, like, what you say there can get picked up by a blog and, like, it's only a big deal. But, I don't know, just be nice to people, <laughs> <laughs> publicly, at least, you know? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you just, it's, like, people want to see, you know, like, there's people who hire people to run their social media, and I just... I just don't respect that because you, it's supposed to be a reflection of yourself. People want to genuinely know more about you, right? So people need to understand that it's a necessary part of the game nowadays. And you don't need to be everywhere. Just pick one or two channels and excel at them, you know? And like, that's all people need. Yeah. I mean, there's some guys who do it incredibly well. Like, Ben Nicky is a beast on social media, right? Like, yeah. he creates, like, <laughs> hilarious and, like, weird content. But he has, like, insane numbers of followers on, like... Uh, what is it, Snapchat and like Instagram and stuff? But I mean, he's he's just the king of that, I think. Um, but then, I mean, obviously, like the big brand guys, like A and B, Armin. I mean, they have awesome social media content and stuff all the time. But they also have realistically a bunch of people probably helping them. <laughs> with it, so yeah, um, yeah, it's interesting though. The um, that's also a shift, like the amount of access to the artists we want. Um, I. I came from like a rock and alt rock and metal. So there was a point in Me time. Too, dude. Yeah. <laughs> there was a there was a point in time where like uh there were like documentaries on bands like Rush and stuff and they didn't really wanna be approached like in their hotel after when they performed and the fans weren't really thinking of doing that as much. Like that's part of why they were such a mad dash when they actually showed up. Um, the the interest in them outside of the musical performance or like that desire to connect has like consistently been increasing for like the last 20, 40 years. And it's been weird to see. Like um, a lot of the rock bands I like, they don't use social media too much or they're like confused by it. They don't they don't understand why they have to share that much about themselves on there I think it's probably the opposite with electronic music because uh, if you really think of most EDM artists it's kind of a very localized fame right uh, in the sense that you go to a show and then nobody really notices you outside even if you're like an Armin level guy like there's very few people who will just notice you on the street probably compared to like some big like, I don't know, like Nicki Minaj, probably, or something like that. Some big pop artist would right, probably yeah. get noticed everywhere, right? Like, it's still very localized fame for an electronic music artist. And it's just completely the opposite. Yeah, I think what Neil's trying to say is that we're in a bit of a bubble. Like, when someone's obsessed with that sort of music, like, I'm, you know, I'm very much obsessed with electronic music now, right? I listen to so much of it and whatever. But you kind of lose perspective of how small this blip really is on the grand scale of music popularity and like pop culture actually absolutely um, yeah you know even like the biggest artist in the electronic sphere like armin's armin is someone who i think like you know crosses over to that pop culture level like he's a big name especially like in you know, his home country and stuff but you know when you take one step down from that and um there's guys who are massive in our world like above and beyond and stuff i mean 
you know, I'm sure they do get recognized in public, but probably nowhere near as much as like we expect them to, you know, like we expect them to be world superstars everywhere they go. But in actuality, like they probably don't get approached like 50 times in an airport, you know? Um, yeah, I think we just, it's easy to lose sight of that when like, when we're so like immersed in this little sphere of ours, like, you know, these are the guys who are like, you know, our idols and like that we look up to so much. And I think, uh, it's easy to lose perspective on how small, um, you know, this whole little industry is actually in the grand scheme of things, right? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. There are people who are like famous and then most people don't know what their faces look like. Uh, particularly like Daft Punk. I, I couldn't recognize Daft Punk. They're walking down the street. Yeah, that's, think, inten- that's intentional though. Yeah. I think only a few people, right? I mean, there's been some photos I've seen of them, right? But <laughs> yeah, I think it's well, if you definitely were, intentional. Yeah. There are pictures of them online. Yeah, I think you could find out. If you were but like a hardcore, you needed to know that you could find it. Um, but yeah. yeah, there's there's a lot of that. And it's it's no surprise that for like trance music in particular, um, like when you're talking to someone from like another genre of music, you probably have to send links and songs and stuff to explain who someone is. Um, they're definitely not going to like recognize ATB in an airport. They're like a big Oslo fan, right? So it's like localized in that sense as well. We're like, they're a little bit separated unless you're checking out everything all the time. Yeah, for sure. Like the weirdest, I mean, this is a story I should probably not share on an interview, but the funniest thing I've ever had is like some girl I matched on Tinder a long time ago. She'd heard my music. That was like the first time that ever happened to me. (laughs) (laughs) That's super funny. That's funny. Have you guys seen this uh, celebrity uh, t- Tinder thing where they steal each other's phones and start like sending incredibly weird messages to people? No. Oh, oh that man. Sounds amazing, though. There's one where uh, one of the guys takes Hannibal Burris's phone. So he's Hannibal Burris on Tinder and he starts hitting people up and just sending like incredibly awkward messages. Like, I want to put a baby in you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, it's like a... Um, Neil's standard pickup line. Yeah? What the... <laughs> it's fun. They have, like, a whole whole channel, like, different... Uh, they'll do it in, like, teams. So two two celebrities, and one of them do it to each other, and then the other one will get their phone and do it back. Uh, I'll check this out. Maybe I'll do it to Shaheen sometime. <laughs> <laughs> My two new games are already catastrophic enough without <laughs> sabotage. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about you guys do you share online is there anything in particular you like you care about outside of the music sphere that you're like this is awesome and you share it a lot I mean I work in video games uh, for a day job so okay. uh, I have a lot of nerdy stuff there um, I just got back from Gamescom which is like the, the biggest games convention in the world or um, over in Germany and I was just there for a week I was doing like a influencer event so inviting a lot of big name YouTubers and Twitch streamers uh, I mean, and, and this is another example by the way of like when we're talking about the size of like you know things in our industry and how we kind of get you know kind of blinded by it like you know uh, just for an example like I think Above and Beyond have like 450,000 subscribers on YouTube right but then I was at this YouTube event and uh, just talking to these like random guys, like this kid's like, I don't know, he's probably like 18 or 19 and he's just sitting next to me at this event. And he's like a YouTuber we invited out. And this guy has like 8 million subscribers on YouTube. And it's like, that's 20, that's 20 <laughs> times like the size of A&B. And then you're like, holy shit. Like, you know, that's just, it's just going kind of goes to show like, you know, these guys um, are huge and, um, you know, the, the power that they have, like, that they have to create a piece of content, you know, everything they do is going to get, like, half a million views or whatever. Yeah, it's you know? incredibly and, interesting, that whole yeah. that whole thing. I am a little bit older than the people who are on YouTube all the time, so I see, like, a little bit of what I can find, but most of these people, I don't, I don't freaking know them. And then someone has yeah. to, like, explain what the channel is to me. It took me, like, I felt like an old guy. They had to explain to me why someone would watch, uh, like, PewDiePie comment on playing a game instead of just playing the game <laughs> themselves. I'm like, why would I? But I could play the game. I don't get it. 
Yeah, I'm I'm weird. I mean, I, I work in the industry, so I get it. But like, it's it is even then, it's kind of I understand where like why people find it weird. Um, but yeah, so that's why I, I tweet a lot about video games, basically. Um, yeah, you know, and I love going to these events and like these game conventions and stuff. I'm a huge nerd, so cool, man. What do you do for a uh, for your day job? Uh, so I just started this new job, which is basically running events for these influencers, like YouTubers and stuff. So what we did in this case is we basically flew a bunch of these guys out to Gamescom uh, in Germany, and we had an event where they were playing a game for one of our clients, and it's a game that's coming out in a few weeks. And so basically uh, what they do is they come to this event, um, some of them are paid, and they get you know free food, free drinks, whatever, and they get like a couple of days of capture time so they can capture the game, uh, video it, um, and then... Generally, what happens is like they'll get, you know, they'll publish that video content. Um, so cool. that's that's kind of what we just did. Prior to that, I was working at a company called Wargaming, which is like known for a game called World of Tanks, um, and I was kind of doing online marketing and digital marketing work for them. Okay. What about yeah, you, Neil? So it's totally, totally different than music. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my background is actually in uh, software. Um, so I used to work at Cisco Systems for a while. Uh, now I do some freelance web development. Actually, currently doing some stuff with uh, Shopify, um, but it's all freelance uh, web development stuff that I've been. Uh, is kind of my expertise currently. Cool, cool. Uh, and apart from that, I'm a huge uh, Rick and Morty fan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, we went to the Rickmobile a few weeks we ago. We did. Shaheen and I went to the Rickmobile, which I don't know if you know, it's this huge car that looks like Rick. Uh, it's like a big van and Rick's face on the back, and they just travel around uh, the U.S. with a bunch of merch and the pop-up stores. Oh, man. And, that sounds super And we, fun. Caught it, we caught it when it came to, I think it was like San Jose or something like that. Nice. Yeah, it took me uh, a while to check that show out, but it is amazing. I'm obsessed, man. <laughs> he got me into it. I, I didn't watch it for the longest time. Um, it used to annoy me. I used to hear like the sound bites. I'd be like, what the hell is this? It sounds so lame. And then when I finally sat down and watched it, I was like, okay, this is actually really funny. Yeah, I could I could imagine getting a sound bite of one of those like rambly tangents he goes on where he grabs Morty <laughs> and being like, what is happening right now? Yeah. So the way I actually heard it, just to show you how nerdy I am, I play a game called Dota 2 and there's like a voice pack you can get for the game where it's like their voices instead of the commentator. And I, and I, you know, I used to hear that sometimes and I'd be like, this sounds like the most annoying show ever. <laughs> um, and then I finally sat and watched it and now like, you know, now I think it's funny, but it took that, you know, actually watching it to find it funny. I used to just hate it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you have to know the character. Uh, my favorite thing in the world for like a week when I watched season one was uh, Mr. Meeseeks. Mr. Meeseeks, actually, yeah, it was my, it was my, bir it was my birthday last week and my brother got me a little uh, Mr. Meeseeks character for my studio nice. to put on, my, on top of my speaker. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you a Morty, too. Yeah, Shaheen actually got me a Morty from some gaming thing uh, about a year ago. So now I have a Morty and a Meeseeks sitting on my speakers. <laughs> Those are fun, man. You gotta keep the environment like playful. It <laughs> helps with the creativity. I know um, Heatbeat has a couple of like Goku's and random Dragon Ball Z characters on theirs. Nice. <laughs> Neil is a yeah. much more legit studio than me. I mean, his he has an actual dedicated room to that stuff. I mean, it's important that you have to, you have to really like enjoy your workspace, or especially when you're making music. Otherwise, if the vibes are bad, then you can't really get in the zone. You know. Yeah. So what does your uh, room look like? Uh, I mean, it's a fairly... I don't know how to describe it, but... It's well, if you there. go to our website for the masterclass, you'll see it. That's where we filmed the video, actually. Yeah, actually, there's... Yeah, if you go oh, okay. to skynsnr.com, the video that we're sitting in is my studio. A bunch of orange curtains on it, which helps with the dampening, and I have a bunch of uh, soundproofing and stuff, so it works really well. I'm, 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 uh, I've been in this room for... Four or five years now, four years, so I know the sound of it really well, so yeah, uh, it, it helps when I'm, when I'm trying to like mix or master something. Yeah, that whole acoustic side is, uh, is really interesting to get into. Mm -hmm. I, um, I recently got into like spectrum analyzers and using those on the reference track so you could flip between the spectrum of their track and yours. 
Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting to see like what you think works in the room and then see like um the readout telling you like correct it over here or something. And then it kind of saves yeah. you a trip to like the car test or whatever where you're like, right, why is this right. not working anymore? <laughs> So is that similar to, so one of my friends just bought uh, some kind of analyzer, which you, it's kind of like an impulse response thing, and then it analyzes your room, and then it adds an EQ on top of your speakers. Oh, the, uh, that, the Sonarworks thing. Yeah, that's the one. That's yeah. The one. I've been looking at those as well. That's interesting. That's more like, um, are you familiar with Convolution Reverb? Yes. All right, so basically the way Convolution Reverb takes the impulse and simulates that reverb room, um, the the Sonarworks thing takes an impulse and tries to simulate uh, like an acoustically dead room. Okay. okay. So it, it does like a match EQ on your master channel to try to dead that room for you. Cool. Yeah, my friend said he got it about... Uh Three or four weeks ago, and he loves it, so I might Still try it out. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that stuff's interesting. It's like um, a lot of a lot of people don't get into that side of things. Um, for me, I'm like I'm a desktop guy. I can't I can't navigate on the laptop comfortably. I need like the desk, and then I need like the mentally sitting down over here to work on it thing. That helps mm-hmm. a lot. I know what you mean. Like, I have recently, recently, as in like the past year or two, been able to kind of just get on. My, I produce on my laptop, anyways, but um, I know the full feeling of having to be in the studio in your chair, like with the table and everything. But recently, I've been able to chug ideas out just kind of on the sofa or in Starbucks. So <laughs> it's it's good. It's more flexible. But always, whenever I'm, you know, like in the final phases of a track when it comes to mixing, mastering, and making everything sound clean, I have to be there you know, at my chair in the studio. Cool. Yeah, yeah. It was funny. Actually, we were at our friend's house this last week, and I was listening to some demos for Ride, uh, which is the label that I help uh, A&R and manage, and I was listening to them on my MacBook laptop speakers. And I remember our friend was like, um, what are you doing? Like He was like, <laughs> how can you listen to this on like, laptop speakers? And I was and honestly, it was just like it wasn't about the, it wasn't about the mix down. Like you know, like a lot of the stuff that I listened to, it was just like I could hear how something would sound just from you know crappy MacBook speakers. Like, um, and then, like Neil said, when it comes down to actually producing the, the end of a track, like you know, to wrapping a track up and getting the mix down and everything clean, then yeah, you need a nice system to do that. But you know, when you're just listening to something like objectively, just like hey, is this a good song or not? You know. Um, I could probably do that with almost any pair of headphones like, yeah. or anything. Yeah, there's no reason you shouldn't be doing that with the a and r too, because that's how the majority of people are going to be listening to that music. I mean, yeah, Shane yeah, Sh- 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 listens to a lot of demos for Ride, and, and I listen to a lot of demos for my label, Adrenaline Room, and like I think we both kind of... You can even listen to it on your phone if you really need to. Like, It's more about the composition. Like, yeah, exactly. If a track is compositionally there, then... We generally don't have a problem, you know, quote unquote, A and Ring someone to get it to where it needs to be sonically. But you can't, you can't be the other way around. Right. Yeah. You have to have a good song. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. It's like that's exactly it. Like ninety percent of the time, I'm just listening to see like whether or not the song itself is strong enough. And then if the mix down isn't exactly super clean, then that's something that we can work on later, and I'll listen to it on a much better system. But. Um, you know, most of the time it's just the initial stage. You can tell on almost any any headphones or speakers. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask about since you were talking about the bass design. Is this primarily like wavetables and serum? Do you use a lot of like um, saturators? Like, how big is your signal chain? Um, so it is mostly based around serum i would say about 90 percent based around serum uh, which is all wavetables and um i use a variety of wavetables i've just found online um the the actual processing that happens on top of that is usually just a little bit of saturation and eq and compression to really glue everything together nothing too crazy because the craziness comes out of the actual synth for me 
Um, okay. I mean, in, in, any, in any aspect of producing, I've always tried not to polish a turd in the sense of, like, start with a good sound to begin with, you know? Um, yeah. Compression is usually always needed for any anything, and, and saturation always helps, but that's usually the extent of the actual effects processing. Do you have any uh, go-tos for that that you like? Uh, favorite distortion? Uh, Saturn is great. Ableton's saturator is actually really great, the built-in one. Um, but uh, the uh, Saturn is actually really good, too, from uh, this fab filter, right? Yeah. Yeah, the... Uh the stock Ableton surprisingly good. A lot of people are really into the uh, the a bit warmer one. Uh, are you talking about the Redux or um, no? Just the saturation. There's a the way oh, the, the 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 preset. Yeah, I know yeah, yeah. exactly what you're talking about. That if I'm if I'm going to choose a preset, that's usually the one that I choose. The bit warmer one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's weird how they do that. Like um, the OTT is great too, and a lot of people love it. And that's like just oh yeah, under forgot, the, absolutely OTT. A lot of people use OTT, but it's easy to get really carried away with OTT. Yeah, you could um, you could just grind that sound apart. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could just completely rip it to pieces. Um, it's definitely good, and um, I think uh, Shaheen told me this a while ago. I think even Dead Mouse uses OTT on his masters chain sometimes. I don't think it was uh, me. I didn't say that. Maybe it was, <laughs> I, was <trying> to, <laughs> I could have sworn it was you, dude. But uh, it was anyway. Someone told me, but he puts a little bit of OTT on his master, um, which, as long as you're doing it in parallel or you know a bit of dry wet, I don't see a problem in it. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, the weird he thing does. with OTT is even when it's like at zero percent or whatever, it's still. You guys are talking about the Ableton one. I'm talking about the the, the standalone expert? plugin one. The, the yeah, standalone yeah, one is built off. Is based off of the Ableton. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah. But what I mean is, the, the standalone one, like even when it's at one percent, it's or zero percent, it's still doing something to the sound. But like honestly, sometimes with sounds like that little bit of multiband compression that it's doing um, is honestly enough. Like I, I don't tend to go higher than like twenty, thirty percent of that thing almost ever. I used to smash things through it really hard, and it, like you said, it destroys the sound. It feels like it's tearing it apart almost. And it gets it really thin. But like a little bit's really nice. Yeah. Unless you're going for that kind of thing, you know, for something that's sitting in the background, you can really squash it and just, like, let it sit underneath everything. But if it's a main sound, usually you don't want to do that. Yeah. The uh, X for one is interesting because you get the upwards and downwards compression knobs. Yeah. That's kind yeah. of useful. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, do you guys use, like, a limiter at the end of the chains to try to control the signal more? Or? Master chain or uh, uh, individual track. steps? Yeah. Like Which the one? Individual, individual steps? <laughs> the individual track or like the group? Um, it depends on the sound, right? Like, if you have something that has a lot of transients and like, um, has a huge dynamic range and some things are popping really loud and are, you know, are going to take up a lot of space, a headroom, then yeah. Um, like drums, I think are a good example, right? You'd probably limit them some, slightly. Yeah, drums would be the one. Uh, I generally don't have limiters at the end of my main stem groups, but if anything, it would be drums. Mm. Anything that has like a crazy dynamic range, basically, because like if you have, you know, one sound that is just super loud compared to everything else, then you're gonna be basically peaking really loudly, and it's gonna be eating up a lot of space in your headroom. So in that case, maybe you'd use a limiter. But generally, I think like you know you want to fix things as you go along too, so you don't want to have like crazy. Uh, dynamic range issues and then run that through a bus and then like you should try and fix it at the source sound is what I'm saying if you can right because that just saves you a headache later on yeah definitely um, and also I, I, tend, I generally tend to do a bit more group compression rather than master compression so like our master chains are generally fairly light um, but uh, if you compress the groups that are leading into the master you usually end up with a fatter sound than just trying to squash everything uh on on the two bus yeah absolutely uh, a lot of people i know are interested in doing two limiters as well just so you don't have to squash it as hard they'll do one to catch the peaks and then one to get like the main bulk of the sound yeah definitely uh multiple phases of uh compressors and limiters is always good yeah the other thing too with that is like you can set different, I mean, more with compression than with limiting maybe, but, you know, you can have different attacks and releases, so you'd have a couple of them set up 
one after another um, to kind of do different things to the sound, right? Some of them would be to catch peak, some of them would just be to level out the sound. A good example, I think, is vocals, right? Um, mm -hmm. Vocals overall, like you'll have these kind of plosives or, you know, the transients or what, not necessarily the transients, but just spikes in, in volume and like you want to control that stuff. So you'd have something with a bit of a shorter attack, but then if you want to like actually smooth out the overall volume, then you may use another compressor like an LA-2A or something that's a little bit slower and, you know, more transparent um, in, that, in the sense that it's, I mean, it it does change the sound, but, you know, it's, it's less noticeable, I guess. It's not smashing the sound so much, and it just kind of levels the overall signal. Yeah, it's a lot less colored. Yeah, I mean, I love the LA-2A, actually, because it kind of warms up the sound a little bit. Like, you know, there is that sort of harmonic distortion stuff that kind of goes on uh, a little bit when you put it on a, on a channel, but mm -hmm. um, generally, it's it's a fairly transparent... Um, I mean, it's actually considered a limiter, isn't it? But, uh, you know, compressor or whatever. Cool. We use a lot of UAD stuff. Yeah. Both Neil and I. Yeah. It, uh, Shaheen has way more DSP than I do. But, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I stopped uh, using so much, though. I used to use a lot more of it than I think than I do now. I would imagine when you guys are breaking down uh, the projects to like a base project or something, it kind of frees a lot of that up to get a little crazy and then it comes back in as an audio file anyway. Yeah, bouncing the audio is always great. Uh, whether you're doing to free up DSP or uh, to kill, I don't know, like 10 instances of serum, <laughs> it always helps. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, as an example, Neil literally just sent me some stuff today, and it's like, you know, bass, stem, sidechain. He actually, yeah, this is weird, um, the Ableton stock sidechain is actually really nice for some stuff, and then I usually put like a like an LFO tool or something just to tweak the attack, but the actual pump of like the Ableton sidechain is super nice. So he usually sends me stuff like that with the sidechain. And so that's like one stem. Like I said, like in swipe, it's the same thing. If you look at the project, it's just as base. <laughs> you know, he had this huge session where he's probably grouped it all together and then like compressed it all together and then even sidechained it before he sends it to me. You know? And all that comes to him in just one stem. And most of the time, he manages the, the master project, so I'm just sending him stems. And it'll be like, I think, I just had the project open. I think it was about 20 stems in just that one base stem that I sent him. Are you guys doing so, Splice, Dropbox? How is this going? So I, I, I would, we would be doing Splice, except we're on different DAWs. So I'm on Ableton, which is conducive to Splice, but he's on Cubase. Oh, Okay. Um, but I do do um, I do write a lot of music with my younger brother, who's a vocalist uh, down in LA, and uh, we both use Ableton. So Splice is perfect for us because um, I'll usually just start producing the track, send him a bounce from a new project, and he just starts writing vocals on it, and all that stuff is automatically synced with me. So it's super useful for that kind of use. Cool, cool. I know a couple guys who actually don't like it because they um, they'll have like a different version of a plugin. And then they'll end up having to ask for the stems anyway. So like, so I've noticed that if you're going to collab, two producers are going to collab. So it's easy to collab with a vocalist because they're always going to be just dropping audio stems in, right, from recordings and stuff. But if you're two producers that are going to collab, you're going to have to bounce a lot of ideas to audio and commit a lot of stuff to audio or uh, just keep the MIDI in there or yeah. both. Yeah, definitely. It's a good habit. Like uh, committing to audio is a good habit, nonetheless. So I think it can only yeah, be that's better. something we've learned. I think over the years, right? Yeah, for sure. That just balancing something to audio sometimes it's uh, like it, it forces you to commit. And I think in in a world of like everything being digitalized and computerized, like it's really hard to do that. <laughs> and it's actually like it's a hindrance to progress. I think not committing to stuff in a session. Definitely. Yeah, people are always like, yeah, man, I, I, I just want to be able to go back. I want to be able to go back. But, like, if you have the confidence to be able to rebuild it, then that should be a non-issue, you know? That's like, a good Like, I'm, I'm committing the sound to audio, but I can always rebuild it. Like, I'm confident of that. So, uh, I think when people have that mindset where, like, they just want to keep going back, it, it's like what Shaheen said, it's more of a hindrance. Yeah, fair enough. 
I used to be in that. I mean, I still am. You know, I always get that like, see, like that fear that like makes you seize up. Like, oh, I don't want to print this audio. But like the way I get around it now is I just save a new project file. I'm just yeah. like, okay, save this as like version three, and then you know, work on version four with it committed to audio. And like 99 percent of the time. I will not need to go back to that old version for any reason. But if I do, then I have the project file there. It's just something that, like, it's a tip that I kind of, uh, you know, or a trick from my own workflow that I've learned over the years is, like, just save a new project file, and then it's you know, it's fine. I don't have to worry about it. Uh, is there a point it, in time in particular in which you decide to do that? When my computer starts having a heart attack, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Usually around that time when it starts chugging. Uh, either that or like when I've just finished like a really big stem, like it could be like the lead sound or it could be, uh, the you know, examples, the bass stem or something like that, um, which has like lots of layers, but it's really just one sound, you know, when it's like cohesively put together. I think that's usually like basically when I'm, when I'm happy with the sound and I know that like, okay, this sound's going to sound good enough and um, – it's just eating up tons of resources now, just being on like four or five different synths and like all this processing or whatever. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, uh, I think we've been talking for like an hour now. Is there anything else you want to throw it in before we call it a day? Uh, what else? We could talk about upcoming gigs, maybe. We have a couple. We could talk about uh, label stuff. Shaheen runs right. I run my own adrenaline room. We could talk about uh, a masterclass, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Just a couple of things yeah, I saw in my head. Yeah, a masterclass. I think like yeah, we have two gigs coming up, which is cool. So I don't know when this video is going up, but we have uh, a gig in two days. <laughs> <laughs> so we're playing. Uh, there's an Ali and Fila show in San Francisco, a 10, 15 Folsom. We're going to be at, and then the following week we're going to be playing in Minneapolis, which is crazy. Um, really cool. We're playing on a boat party. Dance on the Mississippi show. River. So, oh, yeah. fun! It's gonna be really fun. Yeah. So uh, for people in the Midwest, uh, we were actually meant to play in the Midwest uh, as another back-to-back -back, um, a few months ago as part of Silk. Uh, they were doing like a show, but it didn't happen. So we're kind of mm. thanks for coming back to the Midwest. It's gonna be fun. Are you guys part of an agency or? We're completely independent. No agency yet. Oh, cool. So you guys are setting this up yourselves. Yeah, I mean, we figure the the more we can do ourselves, the better it'll be when we're actually on an on an agency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm curious how one sets up like a trip to Mississippi from. You guys are both California based, right? Minneapolis. Yeah, <laughs> Minneapolis. Um, I I got approached a while back um, by someone who liked listening to my music, and uh, she was a big fan, and her friend runs events in Minneapolis, and so. They were talking for a long time about um, doing a show there, and there was a show that was meant to happen a few months ago, and it didn't happen. But then, when they decided to throw a boat party, they hit me up again, like, "Hey, you know, we'd still really be interested in getting you out here." And um, so, really, it just happened organically. Like, I just had a fan of my music who was friends with a promoter out there, and that was it. And then, you know, when they asked me to do it, I was like, "Well, look, Neil and I are doing a lot of music together right now. It'd be cool for us to do kind of like a back-to-back -back thing." and uh, I think over the next few months slash years, uh, you'll probably see a lot more music, which is like Sky and S and R together. We're, we're doing, we both have a couple of releases I think upcoming, you know, that are individual um, ourselves. But we'll be doing a lot of more music together, and so we'll probably be playing together a lot more too. Cool, man. So, like when we're when you're completely independent, like like us, that's usually how gigs from unless at least the out of state gigs, uh, the local ones usually make for yourself, but. <laughs> Usually the out of state ones are like fans reaching out or like love your stuff. Do you want to like like play at one of our small independent parties or something like that? And it was like the same for me. I got invited to play in Sri Lanka a couple or twice actually in the past two years from just people who like to listen to my music. So cool, cool. Yeah, that's pretty useful for the uh, the fans to know. They're like someone who's got the ear of a local promoter. That yeah, I mean, it's, good to, it's good to know that people are listening to your stuff in, you know, so-and-so region. It's amazing. Yeah, and, look, if anyone's listening and they want us to play somewhere, like, we'd be we'd be super down. Just hit us up or hit up a promoter and get in touch and see if we can make it happen, you know. This seemed like a really fun opportunity to go out there and play at a boat party and, 
Um, I've never been to Minneapolis, so we'll get to see the city for a few days, and yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, yeah I, actually, actually, we already know where people are listening to our music because of all of our Spotify insights, but but uh, you never know who the super fans are. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. So there's that, and the master class, like we said, um, go to sguynsnr.com and um, sign up there. We're looking for a late September slash early October start date. Um, I may be moving houses. That might be why. We might have to shift the dates just like a week or two, but um, uh, yeah, it's going to be great, man. We're really excited about the master class, honestly. I think um, the one thing that we plan on doing that I think is somewhat unique is that we're going to try and dive into some of the projects that people have probably heard of ours. Um, like to swipe, for example. Yeah, yeah. Do that. Show people what swipe looks like from the inside, and you know, kind of run through all the different layers. And um, hopefully, I can show them my Omen in the Rain remix, which was on Anjuna, and you know, just a few projects that they're probably familiar with, and kind of show them like how we did some things and some of the decisions we made and stuff like that. Yeah, it's super valuable to be able to get access to that, uh, particularly because you guys have achieved like these label deals. Uh, you know, we could theory all day. It's another thing to be able to actually open a track on Ride, on Armada, on Arjuna, and uh, take a look at it and see what's actually working at that level. So I can definitely see a lot of people getting value out of that. It'll be really cool. And obviously we'll leave it open for questions and comments and stuff. So if anyone has any, like, if they want to hear something... Um, you know, just solo it out or, you know, they want to ask like why we did something, then we can answer them in real time. So it's not like we're just going to play a video and you can't ask questions, you know, it'll be like an interactive thing. Cool. Or, cool. Yeah. So we can hopefully like answer questions on the fly, you know, like, well, what was the processing on this like or whatever, and then show people and then try to explain why we did what we did, you know? Yeah. I will, uh, I'll have to link that in the show notes for everyone. I'm sure there's going to be quite a few guys who are interested in checking that out. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, much appreciated. All right, guys. Well, uh, thanks for sitting down and talking. Um, yeah, I'll be sure to uh, let you know when this is going up and link everything in the show notes. Thank you for having us. Yeah, dude. Really thanks for having us. No problem. Take care. This was, this was fun.